It may sound strange, but not all pathogens are technically alive. In particular, pathogens like viruses and prions are not technically living things, but nevertheless can harm you and kill you. So that's what we're going to talk about today. Today we're going to talk about things that are described as acellular pathogens, viruses and prions. So stay tuned. Hi, and thanks for tuning in. Today we're going to be talking about things classified as acellular pathogens, or things that are not technically alive, but can act as pathogens and harm you. Ostensibly, we'll be talking about viruses and prions, two non-living entities that can cause vast amounts of morbidity and mortality in human beings. So let's start. If a virus isn't a living thing, what is it technically classified as? Well, a virus is considered to be an obligate intracellular parasite. In other words, the only way a virus is technically functional is when it's inside of one of its host cells. Outside of a host cell, it is actually functionally inert. What's interesting is, despite not being really alive and not really being able to do anything, when it's not in a host cell, a virus can actually live outside of its host cell, in some cases, for thousands of years, which is a pretty scary possibility. But what we'll talk about today to start with is what does a virus actually consist of? And viruses are remarkably small and remarkably simple. It turns out that all viruses are going to have two or three key parts, and there's an optional fourth part that they might have. The first thing that all viruses are going to have is a genome made out of some type of nucleic acid. Now, as we learned before, all living things have a, nucle have a genome that consists of double-stranded DNA, and some viruses do as well. But some viruses have a genome that consists of single-stranded DNA, while other viruses have genomes that consist of either double-stranded RNA or single-stranded RNA, which is very unique because that is not something that living things can tolerate. And it's also one of the reasons why viruses are not considered to be living things. They don't always have to have a double-stranded DNA genome like all other living things do. The other thing that all viruses are going to have is a capsid. And a capsid is made out of repeated subunits of various proteins. So essentially, a virus is really nothing more than a nucleic acid middle surrounded by a protein candy shell. That's all they are. They're just made of protein wrapped around nucleic acids. The other thing all viruses are going to have are protein spikes. And the protein spikes are essential for determining what their host species is going to be. Because it's these protein spikes that are going to need to react with the receptor on the host, the potential host cell, to cause the infection. Now the optional fourth thing that some viruses have is called an envelope. And an envelope is simply a modified version of the host cell's plasma membrane. Some viruses are able to gain this as they leave the host cell, but not all viruses are considered to be enveloped. In fact, non-enveloped viruses are commonly referred to as naked viruses. Some viruses are naked, and some viruses have an envelope. It turns out that viruses are incredibly specific. So while almost every organism on the planet Earth has at least one virus that can potentially harm and kill it, viruses are incredibly specific with respect to which species they're actually able to infect. And some species have a very narrow host range. A great example would be HIV. The human immunodeficiency virus only has a single host in its host range. It's human beings. No other organism on the planet is able to contract HIV. But if you look at a virus like influenza, influenza has a relatively broad host range. Influenza viruses are able to infect a wide variety of birds and mammals, including humans. The same thing could be said about SARS-CoV-2. As far as we know, SARS-CoV-2 uh, attacks a protein called ACE2, which is found in a large number of mammalian species, which indicates that while we haven't shown it for sure, it does indicate that SARS-CoV-2, the disease that causes COVID-19, or the virus that causes COVID-19, may have a fairly broad host range uh, that extends well beyond that of humans. Again, we don't know that yet, but it's very likely. Within that host species, or those host species, um, viruses only target particular cells, and this is referred to as its tissue tropism. So the tissue tropism refers to the distinct set of cells or tissues inside of their host species that they actually infect. 
And this is what is determined by those protein spikes. All viruses have protein spikes that extend outside of their capsid. And it's these protein spikes that need to interact with a specific receptor in order for the infection to actually occur. We call that transmission. So the first step is actually attaching to one of those receptors. And we've talked about this in another video, but HIV, for example, the protein spikes on HIV interact with two receptors on the surface of human, uh, human T cells called CD4 and CCR5. And without that interaction, HIV it cannot be infectious to those cells, which is why HIV only affects human uh, T cells. On the other hand, if you look at SARS, uh, COVID or SARS CoV 2, uh, which causes COVID 19, the particular target on the surface of the cells it targets is a protein called ACE2. Uh, and ACE2, uh, once, the, once the protein spikes on, on that virus attached to ACE2, it can then be brought into the cell and allow infection, infection to actually begin. Now, as we talked about before, uh, viruses have, uh, have unique genomes in the sense that they may have a genome made out of double-stranded DNA or single-stranded DNA or single-stranded RNA or double-stranded RNA. Uh, what's interesting about that is that is actually how we classify viruses. So while they're not technically alive, we do have a classification for them. It's actually known as the Baltimore Classification Scheme. It's not named after the city of Baltimore, but rather is named after one of the world's most preeminent virologists, Dr. David Baltimore, who established the system. And it basically states that viruses are uh, the way we classify them is do they have double stranded DNA as their genome? Do they have a single stranded RNA and so on and so forth? Or are they a retrovirus? So we break the viral world down into those distinct groups. Now it should be stated that that doesn't necessarily indicate how closely related uh, viruses are to each other, but it is a, a unique way of classifying them. So the classification scheme is not based on their host range or what tissues they infect, rather what is, does their genome actually consist of? So as we've talked about before, viruses are not considered to be living things. They fail most of the seven properties of life. The one thing that they actually do have is they are highly ordered uh, for the most part. So they do have a few defined shapes in which we typically find viruses. Uh, the first one is called icosahedral. So they actually form an icosahedron, uh, which are 20 equal sides. Uh, so they'll look kind of like this. Um, Another one is called the filamentous shape. So they kind of have a filamentous DNA that's surrounded by a, fil uh, a filamentous uh, capsid that wraps around it. Uh, a great example of this is the Ebola virus. Uh, a third type of shape you find for viruses is amorphous. So amorphous really doesn't really have a defined shape. They're a little bit softer and less rigid uh, than the other three classes of virus. And the fourth type of virus is called the tailed bacteriophage. Now this is specifically found in viruses called bacteriophages, which target uh, bacterial cells and they have a shape a bit like the moon lander uh, or a spider and what's interesting I always find is uh, when they use when they show like like the prototypical virus they almost always show a bacteriophage and I'm like well uh, bacteriophages don't actually target humans but okay um, they, they target bacteria so we don't have to be afraid of those uh, because they specifically don't harm humans they harm bacteria so those are the common shapes of viruses uh, that we find in the viral world now there are actually viral particles that are smaller than viruses. They're called viroids. So viroids are really interesting. Uh, they don't even have a capsid. So viroids are some of the smallest infectious things on the planet next to prions, which we'll talk about later on. Uh, viroids typically are uh, naked RNA molecules and they kind of fold up on themselves to form a, uh, a single strand, but they base pair with each other to protect themselves. Uh, viroids are most prominently pathogens of plants. Uh, so they can be problematic in the world of agriculture. There is one viroid that is of particular clinical significance in humans. Um, it's actually known as hepatitis D. Um, hepatitis D is a hepatitis virus in name only. It's technically a viroid. And in and of itself, Hep D can't actually cause an infection. But uh, there actually is uh, a, a co-infection rate uh, that a statistically high co-infection rate of hepatitis D along with hepatitis B. And in that case, there's a, a significantly increased risk of uh, that particular infection being much more severe uh, than it would be if the person was infected with hepatitis B alone. So again, viroids are like viruses, except they're naked, they like a capsid, um, and they don't play a huge role in human health and disease. Uh, they're more important for agriculture, uh, but they're worth noting in the context of this particular video. How then does a virus actually infect a host? What does the process of viral infection look like? Well, it depends. Are we talking about an animal virus or are we talking about a bacterial virus? Let's start with animal viruses. Animal viruses uh, progress through four stages of infection. The first one 
is attachment. The first thing that has to happen is those very uniquely shaped protein spikes on the surface of that virus need to come in contact with the proper receptor on a potential host cell. At that point, we've established adhesion or attachment, and the virus is now attached to that host cell. The next step in the process is getting that particular virus inside of the host cell. So the host cell is going to ingest that virus and, and bring it in thinking that it's food or something else helpful. But once on the inside, unpackaging is going to occur and what's going to be revealed is that viral genome. And a virus is really nothing more than its genome. Once it's inside, once, that, once, that, once the viral particles are, are actually inside that host cell, that is enough to actually begin the infection and that cell is going to hijack or sorry, that virus is going to hijack that particular host cell and then make it so that that host cell is doing transcription and translation to make more of that virus. The fourth step in the process is leaving and infecting a new host. So in other words, spreading the infection. So how does this happen? Well, it turns out in animal viruses, there are two ways that it can happen. The first one is called lysis. And lysis simply happens when enough of the virus builds up in that host cell that the host cell then ruptures and blasts viruses everywhere. Um, so essentially, the host cell explodes and typically dies. The other potential route is, is budding. So what happens in budding is this. Essentially, the viruses are produced, and then rather than exploding outward, uh, they sort of just bud off like exocytic vesicles. Now, if a virus leaves through the lysis method, that particular method is going to lead to the formation of naked viruses. There's no membrane to bring with them. However, all enveloped viruses leave through the process of budding. And in doing so, take with it a little piece of the host cell membrane, which nominally looks like an exocytic vesicle. And at that point, that particular virus is an enveloped virus. Now, the difference here with bacteriophages uh, has to do with the structure of bacterial cells. So bacteriophages always exist in that, bac that tailed bacteriophage form. You see, it looks a bit like the moon lander. And when that virus, when that bacteriophage uh, recognizes a very specific protein on the surface of its host cell, remember bacteriophages are viruses and as such have a very specific host range. When they find their particular host cell, they will land and then an injector will quite literally inject the genome from that head of the bacteriophage and inject it into the cell. The remaining, po the remaining portion of that bacteriophage actually remains on the outside of the host cell. It's called a ghost at this point and you can actually see Dozens or hundreds of these collect on whatever host cell uh, they've landed on. It's kind of cool. Here's a picture of it here. Once inside, uh, that virus will be then undergo the process of replication like we saw in host cells. It immediately begins to replicate and undergo lysis. This is what's called the lytic phase. The lytic phase is the sort of canonical reproduction, um, multiplication, and then exploding outwards and destroying the cell through lysis. Not all bacteriophages operate this way. There are certain phages known as temperate phages that when they come in can, instead of doing the lytic phase, do something called the lysogenic phase. And the lysogenic phase works like this. What happens is, is the genome gets injected and then rather than immediately reproducing, hijacking the cell and undergoing the lytic phase, it forms a prophage and integrates itself into the host's genome. And it can lay dormant there for several generations. And every time that host cell replicates, the prophage gets replicated alongside the host cell genome. And then later on at some point, that particular prophase, prophage can actually reactivate and re-enter the lytic phase. Now, when it reactivates, sometimes it's just the virus that pops out. The virus reproduces and then explodes the host cell and goes on and infects new cells. At other times, it takes some of the host cell's genome with it. And when it repackages into those new viruses, into those new bacteriophages, and they go on to infect a new host cell, they will bring with it some of that host, the previous host cell's genome. This is transduction. This is that form of HGT where bacteriophages can actually bring new traits to a host cell. This leads to, in some cases, things called something called lysogenic conversion, which is simply a viral infection that brings with it new traits. So what happens when an organism becomes infected with a virus? Well, in large part, it depends on the virus. So for example, 
one of the one of the consequences of cells being infected with a virus is that they those cells are no longer functional. They're not going to be doing their job because you're going to be making more host cells. And as a result, you start to see those cells within that tissue begin to become less effective. They may be a tissue that's responsible for uh, for removing oxygen. If they can't absorb oxygen as well, then there's going to be a problem there. Or maybe they're responsible for making your liver work. So if it's like a hepatitis virus, it's going to damage the liver cells, and the liver is not going to function appropriately to do its job. Another issue is that the body is going to begin recognizing that there is a viral infection and initiate an immune response. And in initiating an immune response, we're going to get a whole host of things like cytokines uh, and histamines and, and things like that that are going to begin causing the body to appear to be symptomatic. It's going to cause swelling and inflammation and sneezing and wheezing, depending on what type of virus that we're talking about. So that can also begin to uh, manifest as the signs and symptoms of a particular disease. Now, in many cases, uh, the virus is going to resolve itself. The immune system is going to be able to catch up. It's going to destroy the virus and then rid the body of the virus altogether. But that's not always the case. Because in some cases, in animal viruses, they have the ability to remain latent. In particular, uh, herpes viruses are particularly good at this. So when you get infected with a herpes virus, so let's say HSV-1, for example, the initial manifestation is of, of a cold sore. But once the cold sore has remedied itself and it's gone away, now that virus isn't going to disappear from the body. It's going to remain latent somewhere in the body and then reactivate and cause another cold sore later on. The same thing happens with the varicella zoster virus, which is also previously known as the herpes zoster virus, which causes chicken pox. If you've ever had chicken pox in your life, that virus has not left your body. About one in three individuals who have actually had chickenpox, not the chickenpox vaccine, but had actual chickenpox, will develop will develop shingles, which is quite simply uh, a the chickenpox virus coming out of latency and beginning to reinfect the host at that point. Another possibility is the formation of sequelae. So sequelae are what happens after the virus or after any disease has been eliminated from the body, but are either permanent or long-lasting effects of this. Perhaps the most well-known example of this is the sequelae of paralysis following exposure to the polio virus. So 1 in 100 cases of polio on average would damage the nervous system. And despite the fact that the polio would be rid from the body, the paralysis or the nerve damage that was caused during the infection will last forever and lead to permanent paralysis of whatever limb or limbs uh, were impacted by that particular infection. Another example of something that can happen as a consequence of viral infection is a result of oncoviruses. So oncoviruses are viruses that through their activity or through how they behave when they infect the host can lead to an increase in cancer risk or the development of cancer. For example, hepatitis C and HIV are well-known oncoviruses. Upon infection with the virus, your, your risk of developing certain types of cancer goes up because of what happens when these particular viruses infect the body. Another great example of this would be HPV. Certain strains of HPV are responsible for large amounts of cancer because of the activity and the way the virus, the way the virus convinces the system to replicate uh, that particular virus can actually lead to the development of cancer. So certain viruses are oncoviruses and can increase and cause cancer increase the risk of and cause cancer in the people who are infected with them. Another thing that has confounded medical researchers for a long time is how do we treat and prevent viral infections? Well, antiviral therapy has become quite problematic. We'll talk about vaccines and prevention in another video. But treating viral infections once you have them is actually really hard, and there's lots of reasons for this. One of the primary reasons for why antiviral therapy is such a challenge is because there's not a lot to target. Remember, when we want to treat an infection, we want to do some, use something that is selectively toxic. We typically want to target something about the pathogen that our body doesn't have. Well, with viruses, there's not many ways to do this. They have some nucleic acid, they have protein capsids, and they have the protein spikes, and that's about it. Our best bet is to find uh, there are some antiviral therapies that target that that recognition of the protein of the viral spikes on the outside of the virus and the receptor they prevent that sort of fusion from happening so there are some antivirals that do attempt to or try to prevent that initial uh, binding of the virus to the host cell but once we get past that stage it gets even trickier because remember once the virus is inside of the host cell 
it's going to hijack the host's replicative and replication machinery to make more of the virus. So it's going to be using your DNA polymerase to make more DNA or your RNA polymerase to do transcription and your ribosomes to translate those viral proteins. So if you want to stop that process at that point, you have to begin using antiviral compounds that are going to target your cell's machinery. So I think you can see where the problem lies in that. If you're using something uh, that, that, that damages your DNA or prevents your ribosomes from functioning or prevents your RNA or D DNA polymerase from doing its job, that's going to be problematic because you can't just specifically target those drugs to the cells that have the virus. It's going to affect you globally, which can make you incredibly ill. That's why AZT, for example, the first drug ever approved for anti-HIV therapy was so problematic. It, and high, the concentrations needed to actually halt the virus were toxic to the human beings that were consuming them in the first place. The other thing you can try to do is... Uh, is, is affect the ability of the virus to assemble. So one thing that viruses do often have is after the, in order for them to become functional, uh, quite often what has to happen is proteins have to be produced, but they also have to be processed. So for example, HIV has proteins that need to be cut apart uh, by proteases, which are enzymes that cut proteins. Well, protease inhibitors um, help to block uh, the activity of these proteases, which can prevent a fully mature HIV virus from forming. There are also inhibitors that block things like integrase, which is an enzyme that our cells don't use um, that are needed for integrating uh, viral genomes into our own genome. Uh, so certain antivirals target that portion of it. The other thing that really confounds antiviral therapies as well as your body's own immune system is the fact that viruses are hugely mutagenic. They mutate at very, very rapid rates. And there's good reason for this. So viruses have very poor polymerases when they use them. In other words, uh, they their genomes mutate wildly. And you may think that this is a bad thing because remember, the overwhelming majority of mutations are neutral and those that actually do have an effect are typically negative. But viruses don't care about this. So for example, some viruses are so highly mutagenic that 99% of the viruses that are produced in a host cell are completely non-functional. Only 1% of the viruses can act, that are produced in a host cell can actually go on and infect a new cell. But let's think about it this way. At the height of an influenza infection, your body may contain 100 trillion influenza viruses. If 1% of those viruses are actually functional and able to infect one of your cells, that still leaves 1 trillion viruses that are infective. And because viruses are so small and so simple, it's hard for mutations to actually harm them. They basically overwhelm you by sheer numbers. And the problem for your immune system is this. Your immune system is trying to hit a moving target. The viruses are changing so rapidly that they can actually lead, in some cases, to individuals with chronic viral infections having different quasi-species of the virus. So people who have hepatitis C infections or HIV infections quite often have so many different variants of the virus in their body that their body simply can't keep up uh, through an immune response. The problem for antiviral research is this. Uh, which version of the virus do you target? So you may produce a great antiviral, uh, but it only targets a certain type of the virus that isn't even around anymore because it's mutated. So what antiviral researchers try to focus on are parts of the genome of a particular virus that can't mutate that widely, the essential things that are needed. But the other thing to realize is if viruses are mutating that rapidly in response to your body's adaptation to them, they're evolving. And despite the fact that viruses are not considered to be living things, they are subject to selection pressure and abide by uh, evolution's rules on natural selection. So viruses do change over time. We can use the influenza A virus as a great example of how viruses evolve. So viruses can evolve in several different ways. First off, they can evolve to change host species. HIV is a great example of this. So HIV is a virus that we know has actually was actually evolved from the simian immunovirus, SIV, which infects other grade A species. In fact, we know that HIV has actually evolved from SIV not once, but twice. It has gone from being a virus that specifically affects simians to a virus that specifically affects human beings.
They can also evolve within a species to target specific tissues, so they can alter their tissue tropisms. Uh, for example, HSV1 and HSV2 is, are very, very closely related, but HSV1 has actually developed a tissue tropism that greatly prefers the oral mucosa, whereas HSV2 greatly prefers the general mucosa. But there's actually a third virus that's incredibly similar. It's called cytomegalovirus. You might not have heard of it. CMV causes an entirely different infection. It causes actually an infection that can be fatal uh, in, in newborns um, if the mother actually has it, has it and passes it on uh, via vertical transmission. Totally different infections from very, very similar viruses due to changes in their tissue tropisms. The third thing that can happen is they can sort of evolve to just be less recognizable to the particular host that they normally infect. Sort of run-of-the-mill evolution through natural selection. And this gets back to influenza as our great example. Influenza virus, the influenza virus or the influenza A virus actually mutates um, through two different ways. The first is called antigenic drift. The second is called antigenic shift. So let's talk about those and talk about the difference between them. An antigenic drift is very simple. It's subtle changes in the proteins, uh, either the protein spikes or the envelope proteins of the influenza virus that make it less recognizable by the host species. So this is one of the reasons why uh, you may get the influenza virus in the fall of this year, and then you might get it all over again in the fall of next year. Quite simply put, by the time it gets back around to you, it just looks different enough that your immune system can't quite keep up with it. Now, the thing to remember about influenza A viruses is they are labeled by the presence of two different proteins that they possess, hemagglutinin, or H, and neuramidase, N. So influenza A viruses are named things like H5N1 and H1N1 based on the type of hemagglutinin and the type of neuramidase that they actually possess. Hemagglutin is actually the protein responsible for helping the virus get into your cells, and neuramidase is actually important for it getting out of your cells. So they're very important proteins. This is where antigenic shift comes in. Antigenic drift is subtle and small. Antigenic shift is massive and can lead to epidemic forms of the flu virus. What happens with antigenic shift is this. It typically is going to occur in an agricultural setting, and it involves a human and some type of livestock, very commonly a bird or swine or pigs. And the reason why is all of these animals are very susceptible to catching multiple versions of the influenza A virus. So if a single host is infected with two different strains of the virus, let's say H5N1 and H3N2, okay? Well, one of the things we have to know about the influenza genome is it actually, it actually consists of eight different segments of genomic information that can sort of recombine. So if a single host cell gets infected by H5N1 and H3N2, occasionally not all the pieces get put back together. So that particular species or that particular host might not give off viruses that are H5N1 and H3N2. Instead, you might get one version of the virus that's H5N1 and another that's H3N1. And while you might get H3N2, you might also get H3N1. And as a result, you end up with a completely different strain of the flu virus that human beings have never seen and have no immunity to whatsoever. And you end up with this new mutant version of the virus that is now massively infective and, and massively pathogenic because your body and no human body has seen H3N1, for example, or H5N2 before. And this type of antigenic shift is what ends up being responsible when we have these really bad influenza scares periodically. About once a decade or so, we hear about the avian flu or the swine flu. Why? Because this is typically how these particular antigenic shift events originate. And antigenic shift can be very, very consequential when it comes to human beings. Typically, uh, because influenza virus is so potentially lethal, we have now developed a vaccine against it. So every year, um, a vaccine is available. Typically, the influenza vaccine contains the last year's two most common influenza A variants, as well as one or two of the most common influenza B variants. Influenza B isn't named with H's and N's. Uh, it's named slightly differently. And this is what becomes the flu shot for the given season. Now, there's lots of controversy about whether the flu shot actually works and so on and so forth. 
The flu shot works. The statistics are clear that the flu shot does help. And the bottom line is, is can you get the flu shot and still get the virus? Absolutely, you can still get the flu shot and still get influenza. But what we find is in most cases, it prevents the virus. And even if you do get the virus, people who have been vaccinated typically end up with a weaker presentation of the virus. In other words, it doesn't last as long and it's not quite as severe. So is it necessary to get the flu shot? I mean, that's up to you, but it's it, all the statistics say that the flu shot is incredibly helpful in both preventing and reducing the severity of any flu symptoms you may develop throughout the year. The last thing we'll talk about are prions. So prions are the smallest of all infectious particles, and quite simply, prions are proteins. They have no membrane, they have no nucleic acids, they are literally proteins that have an alternate conformation that can actually be pathogenic. They're essentially misfolded proteins that go around and convince other proteins to misfold. Prions are responsible for a class of infections that are called spongiform encephalopathies. Now, prions are somewhat of a mystery in terms of how they behave. Uh, the most likely way in which people acquire prions is through ingestion. And what happens is as prions enter your body, uh, they enter into uh, various cells and then they cause all of the proteins in those cells to misform and then those cells die. Now, this isn't such a huge problem in most of your tissues where the cells can readily replenish themselves through mitosis, but it becomes highly problematic when it begins to infect cells in your body, such as your brain cells, which don't regularly reproduce. Because as those brain cells die, they're going to destroy the tissue. And in fact, the name spongiform encephalopathy comes from the fact that organisms that have acquired um, a prion, uh, when, when they do autopsies, when you look at the brain, you'll actually see holes in the brain from the sheer amount of tissue that's been lost to the activity of these prions. Hence the form spongiform encephalopathies. It results in a sponge-like appearance of the brain. Now, in humans, um, we the, the most common form of this is called Creutzfeldt-Jakob. There's another form called Kuru uh, that exists in uh, a, a smaller population uh, of humans. Um, but Creutzfeldt-Jakob is the most common one. There's also something called fatal familial insomnia, which is a genetic variant uh, of a prion-based disease. In other animals, the diseases take on different names like bovine spongiform encephalopathy, commonly referred to as mad cow. Uh, there's one in sheep called scrapey. Uh, in deer, it's called chronic wasting disease. The scary part about prions is there's really no way to detect them. Uh, the way they'll know whether or not you had a prion was when you die and you have a spongiform encephalopathy after you're experiencing uh, battling years of neuropathy and, and all kinds of undiagnosed problems. There's also no way to detect them in your food and no way to cook them out. So we can't simply cook them. Uh, prions are basically indestructible. Uh, so if they're in the food, it doesn't matter how much you cook it, uh, you are going to ingest it. The other thing is the incubation period is quite slow. So you may not know that you have a prion infection for 20 to 30 years after you've acquired it. Uh, and once you've acquired it, there is absolutely no way to treat it. So prions are another version of non-cellular infectious agents. They're basically little proteins, no lipids, no membranes, um, no nucleic acids even. They literally are just a misfolded protein that causes the other proteins in your cells to misfold, killing the cell. So that's it for prions. So today we talked about acellular or non-cellular pathogens, viruses and prions. These are things that are not alive but cause a great deal of morbidity and mortality in human beings. Despite the fact they're not alive, they are able to infect you and cause a great deal of damage and destruction in many cases, uh, leave, their, leave their victims dead uh, in the wake of the infection. I hope you guys learned a lot today. Thank you so much for tuning in and I really look forward to talking to you soon. Bye.